What's up guys? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. In this video, I wanted to share some footage of the Reef Builder Studio from my first visit several months ago when it was arguably at its peak. First, a little bit of backstory though. I had just gotten back from Reefstock 2023 in Denver, Colorado. It was the first time that I've ever attended the show, and I had a really amazing time catching up with the people I haven't seen in a long time, as well as getting to know some new faces over dinner and some adult beverages. That, to me, is really the most fun thing about these shows, all the networking that goes on at restaurants and after hours in the hotel lobby. One missing voice, of course, was Jake Adams, who tragically passed away in October of last year. For years, he was the driving force behind Reefstock, so his absence was surreal to say the least. After all, Reefstock is the Reef Builders show. On Saturday night, there was a memorial for Jake at the Reef Builders studio, and Reef Builders is now under new ownership. Things at the studio are in a state of transition. Many of the corals have since been rehomed, and several of the show tanks will likely be taken down in the future. It occurred to me that the footage I shot from my first visit might have been the aesthetic peak of this studio. Jake had scrubbed down the tanks relentlessly in anticipation of my visit because he knew my camera would pick up every little detail, and he wanted everything to be absolutely perfect. And the tanks did indeed look incredible. Shortly after that visit, Jake passed, and I made a video tribute to him but I never really did much of a dive into the studio itself. Honestly, I figured that it would be in poor taste, so I sat on that footage for months and months. I would sprinkle in a clip here and there, but I was never okay with making, frankly, a video like this. I came around on that stance during this latest trip to Reefstock. Most people never got a chance to see this studio in person, and I thought it would be a shame if I had all this wonderful imagery of it and not share it for people who both loved Jake and loved Reef Builders. What sealed the deal for me was talking with his wife, Windsor, and his brother, Luke. There was zero chance I was going to make this video without their blessing. I care about their opinion on this matter more than anyone else's, and both of them were on board. We all agreed that Jake would have loved to see a video from me about his work. Given that backdrop, Let's take a look at the studio circa September 2022. I can tell you that for the purposes of content creation on YouTube, it really helps to have a dedicated space for multiple tanks that can constantly change and evolve over time. It gives you a lot of flexibility to try new things in terms of types of habitats to create, the equipment to try out, and the livestock choices to populate each of the aquariums. This gallery, is made up of well over a dozen individual show tanks, some freshwater, mostly saltwater, as well as a few large coral vats. Each of the aquariums has a unique theme going on. There are a couple of overarching observations about these tanks worth mentioning though. First off, tanks looked incredibly clean. Jake went crazy cleaning them ahead of my visit, and it is so nice to walk into a place and everything is just so polished looking. Second, Jake is not a fan of sand. When I asked him about it, he basically said, no, I don't have sand because I want to grow coral. Really, really short and to the point. Third thing, this is a collection of some really oddball stuff with very interesting origin stories for everything. Many of these corals are old school gifts from friends in the hobby that you basically can't find anymore. I mean, corals, not so much the friends. Or... Corals that he died for personally and worked with exporters to get them home legally. Fourth thing, Jake doesn't use RO for his reef tanks. He uses the RO only for his freshwater tanks. He can do this because gold in Colorado has fairly low TDS. I think it's like maybe 100. I could never do this at my place. Back in the day when I lived with my parents as a kid, the Akron City water was about 250 and I did just use the tap water. But here at Copley, it's on a well, and my well water is 900 TDS. Yeah, that is not happening. We tried it once, and the next day, all the calcium precipitated out of the water and coated every flat surface with chalk. Yeah, it's not working out. Rainwater is much less, but it still needs to be turned into RO. Anyway, that was like a little tidbit that I found interesting. 
Looking over the overall studio, just scanning over the tanks, there was a tank that had a lot of Acans and Favias. There was a mangrove tank complete with a spray down system, which I think is super cool. This sort of thing is much more common in paludariums or planted tank setups, but I personally have never seen this used on a saltwater aquarium. I saw a euphilia and fimbriophilia aquarium, a tank full of all kinds of oddball things like bismo worm rocks and snake polyps and a very cool orange sponge. And on top of all of that, there were a bunch of freshwater tanks. I really could talk at length about many of these tanks, but I will just point out my five favorite displays. The first set of tanks I wanted to talk about are these coral flats. They are large, shallow acrylic tanks measuring 96 by 48 by 10 inches tall, something in the neighborhood of like 168, 170 gallons a piece. What I like about them is usually when you see these low profile, big, long tanks, they are in a coral farming setting where you have a grid system to organize a field of one inch frags. What we have here is more of an ultra shallow colony collection tank. There are a number of large corals of various types growing in here. Sure, there are frags here and there, but the majority of the pieces are fully grown out. This gives it a unique top-down display aesthetic similar to what you might see in a public aquarium. But unlike most public aquariums, there is a selection of super healthy, super exotic specimens. Not to knock it too much on public aquariums, but not many of them care about high-end corals. And I've had one public aquarium actually say to me, quote, you do not need live corals to teach people about corals. Yikes. Anyhow, this system also featured these smaller end cap tanks. One in particular that I liked had these bismal worm rocks and a collection of multicolored snake polyps. Almost nobody cares about snake polyps, but I thought the one with red spots was really, really cool. One aspect of these aquarium flats I like is how exposed the equipment is. I've always liked that open industrial design because it allows you to appreciate the inner workings of the life support system. The equipment on these coral flats was refreshing because it was all brands that I don't use personally, and I'm curious to see how other things perform. The skimmers were nice and quiet, and I think it has to do with DC pumps. I was unfamiliar with this brand when I first recorded this video, but since then I met a company rep from Delua at Reefstock, and I really wish that there were larger DC pumps for these bigger industrial size skimmers that I tend to use. Anyway, that's an aside. There are also these gyre style pumps on these tanks, and this is my favorite design powerhead for shallow tanks. Their shape allows them to be mounted very shallow without sucking in air, and they make a very pleasing flat blanket of water flow that goes across the top of the water. Real quick, these systems have two different devices managing calcium and alkalinity a calcwasser reactor, and a calcium reactor. Starting first with calcwasser, it's an acrylic chamber that's fed water from the top off that's fed by an Ecotec peristaltic pump. The idea of a calcwasser reactor is that there is a slurry of calc at the bottom that gets gently stirred. Sometimes it's done by a pump, but in this design, it's done by a motorized paddle. It's fed fresh water from the ATO that slowly dissolves the calc powder and gets slowly dosed into the aquarium. Pretty simple. The calcium reactor is from Deltec and operates differently than any other calcium reactor that I've used. I'm used to the recirculating geo designs, and it's a traditional recirculating reactor where you have to dial it in to maintain a specific pH inside the unit. This one is a Deltec that operates differently. It's an automatic calcium reactor that doesn't need a pH probe or controller to maintain that inside pH. It uses a secondary chamber that regulates the amount of CO2 in what amounts to a bubble, and that bubble maintains a saturation state of CO2. As long as there is that bubble, it will maintain a stable low pH. Moving on to the next two tanks. There are these two large peninsula style aquariums in the middle of the studio. They are the big focal points for sure. They're large, they're very bright. The first is a peninsula style show tank. It is a Red Sea Peninsula XL650. I believe they're in the neighborhood of 140 gallons. And in this tank, we have a mixture of Acropora and Montipora. There is a really cool branching Cyphastria. Uh, I really like these bottle brush Acroporas. I believe that they are the Locanize. 
And although that this theme is a very SPS dominant theme, there is a really big Bernard Pora. I love me some Ghanis and Bernard Poras. The corals are growing really tight against one another, and that makes for really dramatic, aesthetically pleasing vistas. As for the lighting that's over this tank, I've never seen this fixture before, but it's made by Acro Optics, which I guess is like a relatively local company from Boulder, Colorado. Jake loved this thing because you could change settings really, really easily from a touchscreen. The other big peninsula is a mixed reef, more of a mixed reef. It's still a little bit SPS dominated. And I think that this tank was a water box that's in the neighborhood of 170 gallons. Right off the bat, huge colony of Hawkins and Red Dragon. There are some Zoas at the bottom. A really cool Ganiopora. Again, love me some Ghanis. And a really large, healthy leather. I think toadstool leathers are underrated. And when allowed to grow out like this, can be every bit as show-stopping as a cool SPS colony. Perhaps my favorite thing about this entire aquascape there is a branching Montipora extending out from a plating Montipora. And he accomplished this by gluing a frag plug of that branching Monty directly onto that plate. Once it starts growing, you still have a separation so they're not exactly fighting. And the lighting over this tank does a good job of providing enough light so that the shade of the branching coral doesn't kill off the plating underneath. Also, there are some weird corals. This coral I would have thought was a stylo, but it's really a palaustrea. And if you look closely, stylos are already difficult to tell from things like pasilopora. And this is another weird wrinkle to throw in there. It's a palaustrea. Also, there is a metalhead branching echinopora horrida. Never seen a branching chalice, quote unquote, like this. And I think this guy's from the Solomon Islands. Always cool to see something new. Moving on, we have this triple decker system. So this would be, I guess, tank system number four. This was formerly his fish quarantine system. As the tanks in the rest of the studio got their fish population settled in, there's less and less need for a fish QT. So over time, this fish QT system turned into a rack system of different little show tanks. Each tier is about 40 gallons, and he's gone ahead and partitioned some of them. It's kind of funny because he has some colorful names for these show tanks, like the Shroom Room, the Chalice Palace, and I think one is like the Coral Garage or something like that, just to kind of give some differentiation. Starting at the top and working down, the top tier is a bunch of different anemones. There is a blue carpet. There is a mix of bubble tips on the right. And this is interesting to me because I've heard that there's some like a leopathic aggression that happens between different varieties of bubble tips where if you start to mix them eventually you end up with just one variety as all the others die but in this case he is keeping several and they're doing pretty good so far on the far left is a ritteri which i believe is like a heteractus magnifica these are very challenging anemones to keep they usually require tons of flow tons of light they're extra moody but this one's doing quite well the middle tier, bunch of LPS. It's kind of an interesting design choice because he has these Australomusas magneted to the back of the tank. I think that these Australomusa are technically now lobophilia. Pretty much in the industry, they're still very much considered Australomusa. And this is the weird one in this tank. This is a what looks like a Calastria, but has been reclassified into its own genus called an Astriosimilia. Astriosimilia. Never heard of this one before, but you can tell it's kind of candy cane-like, but just weird. Finally, the bottom tier, we have the Shroom Room and Chalice Palace. Lots of blue light, low flow, low light. The collection of chalices is like the who's who of all the different color morphs. Very cool. All kinds of different echinoporas and oxyporas, things like that. One reason why I like this particular system so much is that it is the only system that has a coral from Tidal Gardens. There is a non-photosynthetic Pseudocoronactus that has a home here. Again, the weird stuff. Lastly, tank number five. This is perhaps my favorite tank in the studio, and it is a low-light 
LPS reef tank. It is an Australian themed 90 gallon tank filled with very high end corals like scolies, cinerina, and endophilia. There's a few other corals in there such as blastemusa, duncans, and a very strange lobophilia. This tank is designed to replicate a colder water reef similar to what you would see in Western Australia. Corals like this Australophilia wilsoni are typically found in cooler waters, say 72 to 74 degrees, and there's some thought that they take on better coloration when kept in cooler water. In warmer waters, they tend to be a little bit more monochromatic red and blue, while I've seen some that are much more exotic, like pink and yellow straight from the wholesaler. But I think that if you don't keep them in the correct climate, you might lose some of those exotic fringe colors. The lighting is provided by a GNC Blu-ray Pro, which is an Italian fixture. We recently installed two of them in our greenhouse facility, so we have a tiny bit of experience with them. This tank is kept relatively dim in the 70 to 100 par range, and it is almost exclusively blue light. The collection of scolies here I really like because there's some interesting color morphs. I like any super colorful ones, but more than that, my eye drifts to the colors I don't see too often, like this master scoli that is predominantly orange and purple. I don't think I've ever seen one with that color combination before. On the bottom right of this tank is a weird Lobophilia robusta, and this is also from Western Australia. There are two pieces, but despite looking really different from one another, they're actually from the same colony. My absolute favorite thing about this tank, hands down, is the collection of Cyanarina and Endophilia. There are so many nice color morphs of them in this tank, and during this visit, Jake was like, you know, I am really surprised that you're not asking for frags of anything. And then I replied, I want everything in this tank. And that pretty much ended that conversation. <laughs> Anyhow, that does it for my thoughts on the Reef Builder Studio. I am sure that the studio will live on in some form, but I feel like this snapshot in time was one of the last with Jake's fingerprints all over it, and it is something that I wanted to share with you guys. Hope you enjoyed the video, and until next time, happy reefing.